Okay, I'm back. I'm back and hoping that you have come back too. And um, let's see. I know we lost a few people because I had to switch the stream over. But hopefully if you are on Facebook, you have gone to the page and, and seen the new link and and have joined us so that is where we are at at this point so hopefully i am on and people can see me and people can hear me and let's see so it looks like the stream is lagging a little bit, but it looks like it's starting to come through now. So I am hoping that there is no longer an echo in the audio broadcast and that we are good and coming through okay and and uh and and getting ourselves together this morning so i swear i'm probably going to have to like start these at like 8 a.m <laughs> just to try to get going no actually that didn't work last time because last week i started at 8 and we still didn't get going until 10 30 so i'm going to continue to tell myself 10 a.m and hopefully by 10 30 we are up and running so Awesome. So I'm getting feedback that the audio is fine and there's no longer an echo. So we're going to go with that. So thanks for uh, hanging with me and uh, sticking with me through the, the technical issues. So as I am up this morning, um, actually one of my cameras is not uh, is not working. So speaking of uh, technical issues, so I've got this camera, the overhead's fine. Um, one of the the views over the pressing station is fine, but the camera for the sewing machine is not. Um, but I have my handy dandy um, step outs. <laughs> so hopefully uh, I can just show you what to do with these blocks without necessarily needing to sew them. So we will just keep going with that. So thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Claire. Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. So happy to be here with you. So this was week two or lesson two in the Emma mystery quilt along. So I hope you enjoyed taking a look at the block. So there will be a reveal <laughs> in this webinar. So if you were hoping to keep the whole thing a mystery, you probably shouldn't watch them, the webinars, but, um, but you'll see the blocks. And so there's a couple of things that I want to talk through today. So we've got our first block up was an uh, a pieced block along with some applique. So we'll get to that. But I want to actually start with the other two blocks because the other two blocks were a little, were a little more simple and were just um, half square triangles and squares. So we can go through those really quickly. And so I'm just unpacking my little box over here. So let's start, let's start with, I believe this is block B. So we'll take a look at block B. Let me get the, um, let's see, which camera am I going to uh, enjoy looking at? Let's take a look at, let's do this camera. All right. So we'll, oops, nope, wrong camera. It always helps to pick the right camera. So we're going to pop the little feather weight out of the way here. You can see I still have last week's stuff uh, kind of sitting here. So as I go through this block, hi Lisa, welcome back. So this block, this is block B for lesson two. And this is comprised of two half square triangle units and two squares. So it's a four patch and I believe we had a four patch in the, sorry, I'm just messing, I'm messing with the, uh, I'm messing with the uh, uh, microphone here because I think that's a little bit, is that better? I don't know if that's better or not. Sorry. <laughs> so you're just kind of dealing with all of my stuff today. Um, all right. So 
this guy is another four patch we had four patches in the last in the last uh, lesson so in lesson one there was a four patch and this one has the two half square triangles so let me see did I leave any of those unstitched no I did not so um, so these go together pretty um, pretty easily it's you know you've got your if you worked with an easy angle ruler so I have an easy angle ruler here that is just gigantic so they make these easy angle rulers in several sizes this is the ten and a half inch one there's also a six and a half and a four and a half and so the one that you need really is just the four and a half inch unit so you can um, cut those with the easy angle ruler you can also cut them as specified in the pattern which is just to you know cut a a four and seven eighths inch strip, cut four and seven eighths inch squares, and then cut along the diagonal. Now, when you're working um, with those, what ha what tends to happen is you just have a. Uh, I'll just take one of these squares here. What you end up with is a triangle with the points on the ends. And what I prefer to work with is a triangle that has the corners dog-eared. So there's a couple of ways that you can get those dog-ears. One is with the easy angle ruler, you can, you know, take this uh, triangle that gets cut and so just pretend this is a triangle and not a folded in half square. But if you, you know, took this, you could take the triangle and you know, line up uh, the correct edge and just snip off uh, the the other edge the other thing that happens with the easy angle when you're cutting is that one of the corners will be dog-eared and the other one will not be so usually you can just take your easy angle and turn it around the other way and clip off the other dog ear so that is one thing you could do there's also this corner trimmer from Marty Michelle that uh, that I've been um, having and this helps you to trim corners off of half square triangles and quarter square triangles. So I'm just gonna pull out this trimmer. This is a brand new trimmer, so I'm not gonna take the paper off, but you can, you know, on your own, you can take the paper off. It makes it a little bit easier to see leaving the paper on. And what's nice about this corner trimmer is it doesn't matter what size your triangle is. You can, because the point is that you just need to move your corner trimmer to the corner of the triangle so I don't care how much more triangle there is on this end what I'm really concerned about is trimming off the uh, the dog ear on each end so I can just move that to the corner and trim it off and then the top one this trim is actually for quarter square triangles so if you were working with a quarter square triangle you would trim the two sides and then trim the the top uh, edge where and that is reducing the bulk in the center intersection where those come together now one thing you'll notice with the dog ears here is with the Marty Michelle template it actually has and let me switch to the other I'm just gonna pop over to the other camera so you can see this a little bit better but with the Marty Michelle corner trimmer the corner is actually uh, there's two angles here where your easy angle is just a straight um, it's a straight across cut here so easy angle is straight across the Marty Michelle corner trimmer is double there's like a double angle here so I don't really have a preference really it's just this is all about alignment and reducing bulk and you know either way like you know this one when you press it out it's still the bulk is removed and it doesn't show you know on the other side so I think um, and if you're pressing seams open same thing if you press the seam open when you have that blunted uh, edge it's still you know out of the way so I don't have a particular preference between the the double angled or the straight cut it's just the tool that's being used so this is great for 45 degree triangles such as quarter square and half square triangles this isn't this I wouldn't trim the, use this to trim like 60 degree triangles um, you know or isosceles triangles because the angle is different so just be careful with that if you're as you're trimming corners there's different tools for trimming 
those uh, corners. And then of course, some tools that you can buy if you're getting acrylic templates, they will come dog-eared. So for example, my Key West template is one that has isosceles triangles and those templates are already dog-eared. So just depending on how you're cutting, you may or may not want to use a corner trimmer. I like it for alignment and for removing or reducing bulk in the seams. So that is uh, optional. If you want to get a corner trimmer, I have a few of them left on the uh, website. Those of you who ordered class supply kits, there's a corner trimmer included in there. So hope you, uh, you found that and you find it useful. So I'm gonna pause for a second here and just check for questions really quickly as I pop over to the, uh, the YouTube chat. So no questions over there. Uh, and by the way, if you are in and you haven't announced your presence, please let me know who's watching. There's a chat that you can uh, just pop over to the chat and leave a little comment. That would be great. So I am just popping over to Facebook, into our Facebook group to see if anybody has uh, has commented. So, uh, so not seeing any comments about this particular th this particular area. So I am going to move right along. Okay, so let's go back to the overhead camera here and just making sure we stay on. All right, so once you have those half square triangles done, so in this case, I pressed my seams open. So if you look at the pattern, I believe the pattern has you pressing seams to the side. And so as for those of you who are not familiar, some of you have been quilting along with me for quite a while. You know that Linda and I, Linda is the pattern illustrator. She's my technical editor. She and I don't always agree on, you know, which way to press the seams or, you know, how much detail goes in to the pattern. But certainly I trust her to give you enough instruction so that you are able to get the block done and get it done in the simplest way. And a lot of times she is better at that. I would say probably 99% of the time she is better that, at that than I am. <laughs> so um, so it is very rare that I am actually better at, at, um, at that than she is. So sometimes I will give her, like if I have something specific, I will give her specific guidance on how I want something illustrated or how I want it written. So for example, sometimes I will specify that I want something strip pieced. And I don't always strip piece, but sometimes I will specify, hey Linda, can you make sure that you write the instructions and show them strip piecing? Or, you know, and I don't do this a lot, but um, you know, if I wanted to do a method where you make like eight half square triangles at a time, our normal method is to make the half square triangles individually. And so if I have a deviation from how we normally do things, then I have to tell Linda, hey, can you write it up this way so people uh, kind of get it. But I stopped giving like too much information about pressing seams because pressing seams is all about just getting the flattest squarest block that you can get. And there are many ways to do that. So sometimes you'll see me press seams open, sometimes I'll press them to the side. Usually Linda will just make it so that you can, you know, swirl the seams or get a flat block, but we don't always do open seams. But in this case, in the photo tutorial, I did open seams on the half square triangle. So you'll see that on the back of the block. And, um, and I usually use the strip stick. So this pressing stick I showed last lesson and and I make sure the camera stays on. So, um, so the pressing step I showed last lesson, but really the pressing stick is just about, I like having, you know, the rest of the block fall away from the seam that I'm trying to press so that I don't get issues with seams kind of turning a different way than I like them to, to be turned. So there is, so I use the, the pressing stick for that purpose. So that's how I get my seams pressed open. And then once you do that, so here is another one, and I do like to set the seams. So typically I will press on the seam that was stitched and then press the seams open. 
or to the side or whichever way works. So here we go with the two, those two half square triangles. So for this block, the thing that you have to pay attention to is which way the block, the half square triangles are oriented. So this particular block has two squares that are on the diagonal and then the unit that matches your squares goes to the inside. So that's how this block was assembled. And for pressing, when you're stitching this together, it's right sides together and you're stitching along this edge, you stitch along this edge and press the seams toward the squares. So here is my, uh, let's see here. All right, so here is, you know, through the magic of television, <laughs> the, um, the seams here. So I can press this just quickly here, set the seam and get these seams pressed to the side. Do, 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 do. Okay, so that one goes that way and this one goes this way. So we get that pressed. Okay, and in doing that, then I can, so this seam is pressed in that direction and this seam is pressed in this direction. So in that way, I'm able to get my seams nested. So, and I know you can't see the nesting here. I'll swap the camera over here so I can show you a little bit closer, uh, closer up in this camera, but those seams are nested. I'll try not to get too close but the seams are nested there and just fit together really nicely. So then I would stitch that seam. And once I stitch that seam, I'm going to do a swirl. And if you go back to the lesson one video, I show a more kind of a slower version of the swirl seams. But essentially what you're doing is this is the original seam that attached these units together. This is the original seam they, that attached these units together. So this one was pressed to the left. So this one gets pressed down. This one's pressed to the right and that gets pressed up. And in doing that, can you see how the seams are moving in this counterclockwise direction? And we'll do the overhead so you can see the seams are moving in a counterclockwise direction and that allows me to open up the seam in the center. And so, and if you are in a situation where that seam won't open, and we'll just go to the, the closer camera here. So if you're in a situation where that center seam won't open, you can always just go in with a seam ripper, which I don't have uh, handy um, here, but you can just go in with a seam ripper and just pull out the stitches that are preventing you from getting that center to lay flat. So if the center doesn't lay flat, just pull out a couple of the stitches that are holding that, holding those pieces together. I'm not asking you to go in and you know, disassemble your block, because if you see, you know, on the front, I pulled out that stitch, but the stitch that I pulled out is the stitch that's holding that's holding the seam allowances together, not the stitch that's holding the block together. So the block is still solid, and there's not you know there's not an issue here. I just pulled out a seam, or pulled out a couple of stitches that are keeping those seam allowances from laying flat. So if you're having trouble swirling seams, that could be an issue, and you just want to pull out the one or two stitches that are holding those seam allowances together. Okay, so I'm gonna pause again. And just make sure you're still with me. We're still uh, getting going. And, uh, oh, look, we got a couple more people. So Trish has joined us, Janet Deckard. And, um, oh, my goodness, it is um, Mary from Katy. <laughs> so, hola, Mary. Welcome, welcome. It was good to see you at Spring Market this past year. So, uh, or this past May, not past year. Um, awesome. So that is just the one four patch, right? So that was block B this week. So let's move on to block C. So this block is a, 
it's not quite a four patch. I guess technically it's a two patch, but when you look at this, the just making sure my camera's still on up there. All right, so when you look at this, I guess technically this would be a four patch if I pieced it a different way. So here, uh, if I drew an imaginary line down the center, you can see that this would have been a half square triangle unit and a square. So if I had done this as a four patch, it would actually have the same, the exact same units as block B, right? Because I'd have the two half square triangle units and the two squares, they'd just be assembled in a different way. So let me show you um, that, we'll just pretend, <laughs> right? So here is my, where did I put the other one? Ah, here it is. You wouldn't think these things would go too far, <laughs> but here are the four units that would make this a four patch. So the same units just organized in a different way would give me block C. Now, what the reason I point that out is because there are situations where you can use a flying geese unit to replace two half square triangle triangle units and that finished size of the flying geese is twice as wide as it is tall so just thinking about that two squares made side by side doubles the width but the height doesn't change so I'm pointing that out because as you work through if you're looking through quilt patterns and and blocks and wanting to kind of figure out how do you deconstruct them or how do you work with what you have or make modifications sometimes these are things where you can substitute other units so if you didn't have a quarter triangle ruler so that's uh i don't think i have my my quarter i don't have my quarter square triangle with me but if you don't have a quarter square triangle ruler for example this would be a way that you could kind of make the same unit without having um, that ruler the caveat though is that sometimes you know when you are doing this you have an extra seam so you're going to be using a little bit more fabric with the two separate units than you would if you did the quarter square triangle or a solid rectangle right so um so here is kind of a perfect way to see that when i take two squares because i have this added seam allowance to bring these together i'm using more fabric with the two squares than I do with the solid rectangle. Okay, so I went with flying geese here and it's just, it's purely for aesthetics. And you know, sometimes where you place your seams can be a little bit more, you know, more or less obvious than others. So, oh, sorry, I just dropped, dropped something on the floor. Okay, so to make this unit, I use, flying geese. So let's pull this aside. And so I've got a rectangle that's pretty straightforward, but then I have a, oh, and I didn't leave these completely apart. So, um, so here is my quarter square triangle and the half square triangle. So there's a half square triangle already stitched to this unit but you can see the two units and this is a pretty big quarter square triangle this is an eight inch finished quarter square triangle right if i'm not mistaken yes it is and now i'm trying to see where did that actually end up not there oh haha ha, there's another page all right so i'm looking at the pattern and i'm going i don't see the qsc8 but there it is it is fabric 11 for this um for this pattern so this is a qst8 which is an eight inch finished quarter square triangle because we're measuring this edge and a four inch finished half square triangle for the sides so when i'm doing the flying geese i attach one side at a time and so with this side, I would attach that. And again, uh, I press the seams open. I think they're pressed to the side in the pattern. So 
so pressed toward the half square triangle, I believe is what the pattern has. I press them open just because I like to reduce the bulk here in the seam. And then once you do that and you press that open and my strip stick went somewhere. <laughs> so, so eventually I will find it on this table, but uh, so that's pressed open and then I will add my other half square triangle. So again, notice how this unit is dog-eared and when they're dog-eared they match and this top dog-ear now matches the top of this of this unit here with that pressed out. So then that gets stitched with another quarter inch seam allowance. So looking at that from the back, when I press the seam open, that is going to reduce the bulk up here at the top. Okay, so everything is just nicely um, pressed and there's my little intersection there at the top. Okay, and then I would then add the rectangle at the bottom. So once this gets stitched, so another stitch there. So this gets attached to the bottom of the flying go uh, geese unit. So once I press that, and this time I do just press the seam toward the rectangle. Again, just where do the seams wanna go? And that is my finished unit. So you can see that from the back, seams pressed open here, seams pressed to the side here. I am not a seam pressing purist. I just, I do whatever is easiest that's going to give me a nice flat and square block. Okay, so popping back over, I know I went through that pretty fast, but it's a pretty, it's a pretty, it's a large block. It's an eight inch finished block, but it goes together pretty easily. It's just got four pieces in it. So you shouldn't have an issue with that one. But I say all that so that we can move to the next block, which was block number one. It is a block that I ad adapted from Nancy Cabot and she used to write for the Chicago Tribune and just put all these you know patterns out there and what I found interesting is I was reading more about Nancy Cabot and and kind of her legacy with the Chicago Tribune is that a lot of times you know they used to post like these you know the daily newspaper would have a quilt block in it and what I found interesting is that the people that they hired to, because Nancy Cabot, she wasn't the only one who was doing that, certainly at the Chicago Tribune, but they also had, I think, the Kansas City Star and just other other newspapers were, you know, had these uh, columns, and it would just be, you know, they would post a quilt block, and if it needed templates, they would print the templates in the newspaper, which is just really fabulous. But what I found interesting is that oftentimes the person who was writing those articles was not actually a quilter. They were either just a journalist or an artist and what they would do is they would sketch these blocks. So they weren't necessarily making the blocks. So sometimes you would see these just really fantastic amazing patterns in these newspapers that somebody dreamed up and sure it might have templates but they didn't necessarily think about construction wise how should this go together and whether it was actually achievable and something that you could make so that's been kind of fun as I go through my uh, you know different books that I have with clip blocks in them and just try to figure out how were they thinking that this block would actually get made? <laughs> so um, so similar to this, with this block, the spirit of, I think 1876 is the name of the block. You know, I started thinking, how could I make this and make it so that it's actually a fun block to make instead of a um, nightmare? And so I uh, reconstructed this block. So I will show you the finished block. And this block still has a lot of stuff attached to it, but I'll just show you the finished block and it is bigger than my pressing station, 
but we'll show you this with the overhead and let me see if I can adjust sorry the camera's gonna wobble a little bit because it's up above my head awesome okay so this is the block or it's it's a little bit different it's certainly modified I had to change the proportions of the shape a little bit to get it to conform to the shapes that I wanted to use and so so this isn't exactly the same proportion I think her center square is a little bit smaller and of course all of these were um, piece units so there was actually a seam here and a seam here and so there was a really narrow strip in here a really tiny square a narrow strip in here and then these were all curved pieces and I did not want to do that I love this block and I wanted to see how I could do this just with shapes that I already had so we've had I think it was Little House on the Prairie was the first the first quilt where I introduced this orange peel template shape and it actually says dear Laura orange peel set <laughs> so the new ones that I'm producing if you uh, haven't purchased one if you get one now it won't say dear Laura orange peel set it'll say orange peel template set um, but in the the uh, it's a little bit different the size is the same it's just a little bit different in terms of how they were produced but dear Laura was the first place I introduced this six inch finish orange peel and so there's the melon and the arch and for this block you only need the melon for that I also have a Sizzix die this is my orange peel die and it has a melon so it is the same size melon and the two arches so it's a little bit different from the acrylic template set in that you can cut two arches um, on the die kind of flat they're nested here with the single melon okay so those are the same so anytime you see an orange peel unless I say differently anytime you see an orange peel template in one of my quilts it's going to be the same orange peel template and uh, or Sizzix die so it's the same shape the same size the only time that might change I've been playing around with a block call that I call Bama Beauty and so there's a um, there's a different set of templates that goes with that but I'm still playing around with that one and trying to decide what I want to do with that one so with this this is actually a piece block with applique on top so if you don't look too closely at this and I'll let me switch this other camera and see just to give you a little bit of a closer view if you don't you know stare too closely you can't even tell that this is an applique so and we'll talk about how to you know how you can get that same look or get a very similar look so um, so that has to be involved where you've got a pieced block and the applique. So let's talk about the pieced block. So part of the piece block that I was trying to do was to make it so that you had as few pieces as possible to piece the block. And I think in for the most part I have pieced like all of the ones that need to be pieced. But let's just go through the units that are in this block. So there are two large rectangles, two small rectangles, and a center square. And when I talk about modifying this block, it's all about getting the right proportions so that the orange peel is used in the, the right way. So the reason this block is sized the way that it is, and this is a 12 inch finish block, I sized this block so that we could use make the most of the size of the melon and also get a good proportion with the center square so I played around with it a little bit and came up with well if I did this on a 12 inch finished square then we make really good use of the melons and so it was really just a matter of dividing these up so that the proportions made sense and what I in order to get a 12 inch finished block this center square is three inches and then it just goes from there so I'm not going to give you the exact proportions if you have the pattern 
you have that. If you don't have the pattern, you can get the pattern on my website or sign up for the Mystery Quilt Along, uh, which is uh, on my website under Emma. So you can sign up for that if you like this block. So, so that is what I've got there. And so for the applique, you need to first fuse the applique or at least apply the fusible to the reverse of the applique. So how I do this is I apply the fusible before I cut. So in this case, I cut the strip of fabric, I cut the fusible to the same size, and then I cut out the shape. And we'll talk about these dog ears in a second here. Um, but I always, if I'm doing applique, if I'm going to be doing fusible applique, I always apply the fusible before I cut. So the fusible that I use, that I used for this is Stima Seam Light 2 on a roll. And it's 18 inches wide and on a, on a roll. So that is how I, you know, did these and made sure that I was able to get the, um, you know, the number of, it's easier to use the fusible that's on a roll just because, you know, you can be a little bit more economical in how you produce the shapes. So, um, so you're not wasting fusible, but if you have leftover fusible, you can actually, you know, put the pieces, um, you know, and just kind of add them to the shape if you need, if you had like a piece of, a strip of fusible, you know, here and here, you could still do that, just bump them up together. And it's not gonna matter in the finished unit if you're kind of piecing your fusible together. But for these, I like to use a roll because it's a little bit more economical. So always do that in terms of fuse before you cut. The point about the dog ears here is that if you have a, if you got a die cut kit, the die now certainly I have my die, but uh, but when I first did the orange peel shape, I actually had a custom die made, and that custom die had these uh, notches. <laughs> it's like I lost my words for a second. The custom die had the notches in it, so if you've got a die cut kit, the notches are there. So for this applique, before you apply it to the block, you actually have to cut the notches off. So I'll do this from the back just so you can you know, see. So it's just a matter of just cutting right next to the edge and cutting off the notches. And if you don't get it exact, you know, it's fine. It's a, nobody's gonna be in there, you know, kind of critiquing whether your curve is perfectly curved, but you know, just clip off those notches so that you have a smooth melon shape. For those of you who are using my orange pill die or the orange pill template, the notches are not there, so you don't have to worry about it. Okay, so I'm gonna press this seam because I wanna talk a little bit about how we actually get the applique down. So let me open up this seam. So I'm gonna press this seam. Okay, so I press that down and then um, I like to, you can eyeball this. Certainly it's not an issue if you wanna eyeball the placement. If you wanna be a little bit more exact, then you want to fold your block on the diagonal. And in this case, on my pressing station, I'm not gonna be able to get this pressed all in one go. But the idea here is that I'm pressing alignment marks into my block. So we'll do that and then fold it on the other diagonal and get the alignment marks pressed in. Now you don't want this to be a permanent crease, so don't go, you know, don't starch it and steam it and, you know, try to get those marks pressed in. You're just really just trying to get it to be prominent to help you with the alignment. And then with the melon, you want to do the same thing. 
And so with the melon, I'm actually pressing wrong sides together and I'm just gonna finger press because, you know, honestly with the paper there, you're going to get a, a press that is, you know, kind of just by nature more prominent because the paper is there. Okay, so what we're gonna end up doing then is just aligning the two along the diagonal. Okay, now to get the paper off, I like to score in the center. So I don't attempt to peel along the outside edge because what that does is you'll start to roll and you'll start to fray the edges of your, of your shape. So I like to take a pin and just score the paper just like that and peel the paper off from the center. So you can kind of see this start to come off and we just work our way around the shape and peel that off, okay? So now I want to take the tip of my melon to the tip of the square and align, sorry, I'm like leaning into the shot here, and <laughs> just take that and align it. What you can also do is once you get the corner started, just kind of press that a little bit and then flip it over. And what you can do is just make sure that the corner of your block is laying in the seam uh, or that, that fold that you pressed in. Okay, so make sure that corner is along the center there. And then just to keep this from continuing to stick and, uh, and just be a general nightmare to deal with, you can just kind of put the paper back on there. And that will help you as you are working with this block to keep that from sticking to your cutting mat and just making a general mess. So just put the, the paper back on that corner. Okay, so you can work your way around and once you get them in the right place, you can come in and press. And this is also great because if you put the paper back on, <laughs> you can go ahead and press this without having to use a pressing sheet um, or you know Teflon or not freezer paper, uh, wax, not wax paper either, parchment paper, <laughs> you know, I get to it eventually, uh, to press that back on. Okay, so you just work your way around all of the edges. So I'll do that one more time and so that you can see yourself working around the edge. So again, fold that in half, score the paper, peel it off from the center, and I try to get this off in one piece if I can so that I have enough to come back and you know reapply that paper. So again, aligning with the center, pressing that down a little bit. You can flip it over and just make sure that the corner is in the fold. Give it a light hand press. Put your paper back on. and press it, okay? And just follow the manufacturer's directions for how to adhere this. Okay, so that's how you get this block back on. So I'm gonna pause for just a second because I know I've been talking for quite a bit and I just wanna check to see if there's questions on Facebook or in the chat so i see we welcome somebody else benita's here hi benita and check facebook to see if anyone has posted questions so if you do have questions just make sure that you post them either in the youtube chat or on facebook so i can get to them if you post them on the website in the forum it's a little bit harder uh, to get to so um you know and see those kind of live because that's on another site and in another area so, which I don't have up right now. So if you are in Facebook, just press the, you know, just comment. You can add a comment to the page. If you're on the YouTube, just add a little chat and I will see that anytime I pause to take questions.
questions okay so i don't see any questions there you guys are quite grouped today um but uh, we'll go back to continuing to work on this block awesome so i've got a couple of these adhered which is great now i do not stop there so anytime i know that these manufacturers say this is a permanent bond and that's fantastic and you know I agree with you but at the same time I want to make sure that it actually stays where I want it so if I'm doing raw edge applique like this I always want to make sure that I seal the edge with stitching so let's talk a little bit about how you do that one way to do it is with a decorative stitch, a matching thread, but how do you find the matching thread? Now this is going to be incredibly hard to see on either the overhead or this front facing camera, but hopefully you can see that I have four different colors of blue thread here, ranged from lightest to darkest, okay? so. Those are the four spools of thread. And just depending on um, which, you know, uh, how the color shows up in here. When I'm looking at this live, this is lightest to darkest. So hopefully that shows up on camera. Now, in terms of figuring out what thread you're going to use, you don't want to just place the spool on the item and say, yep, that's the color. What you wanna do is actually spool off a little bit of the thread and lay it down so you can actually see what an individual strand would look like. And it's also a matter of preference. So while I have many, many uh, variations in the tone here from light to dark, even though there is that variation, I don't necessarily have to choose the one that is exactly matching, right? So it's it's a matter of personal preference. And I know with these blues, you can't actually see which is the one that, um, that matches. But actually, this is actually a, a fairly good demonstration because what I see here in the, um, and I'm just kind of keeping my hands in here so it's, it keeps the, um, the focus in kind of a lighter focus. But what I see is that this one is pretty bright and it's reflecting a lot of light. And so I'm noticing this thread. This one is darker. This is the darkest of the four and it is absorbing light and so it is showing up darker on this fabric than the other one. So you can, I hope you can see the contrast between these two. This is reflecting the light and so it's showing up um, quite prominently and this one is absorbing more light. It's a little bit darker um, and it's also showing up rather prominently. But this one is, it pretty much disappears in here. So as I move this along, you can barely see that thread show up. Now, if I put this spool on top of this block, when I look at this here, this actually looks quite a bit more purple, I think in the camera that I'm seeing on my laptop, it looks like it's pretty close, but this is actually showing up. It's got more of a purple um, hue to it. But when I roll this out, it practically disappears. And so if you want a thread that matches, that disappears, you have to unspool the thread because it might surprise you as to which one is actually the good, the better match. And same thing with this one. If I look at this one physically um, with my eyeball, this actually looks like the color that matches the best. But when I put this on, it's a little bit lighter and I can still see that show up. Now it can sometimes be hard to, you know, to kind of decide what color you're gonna use if you don't have a lot of variety of thread. And the other piece is that when you're working with a print, you can't always get a perfect match. 
because the print might have many colors in it. And so with that, you kind of do the best that you can. So what you can also think about doing is a contrast. So I have a red here that matches the center. And so I might think about doing an applique stitch where it actually contrasts. So this red is a good match for the center and it contrasts on the, um, what do you call that? <laughs> on the, um, the applique. Now what's interesting here is with this red and blue in the camera, it's fascinating. It looks like the red is actually blue. It's picking up the the color there so this might actually be kind of a great um, contrast and then another option is to just go completely um, out there and just pick a completely different color entirely so this is like a silver gray I believe this is a medium gray and so you could do that and just go with something that contrasts to really make that stand out but when I did these, I actually picked a thread color that matched really closely to that thread or to the shape. And if you ordered a kit, um, whether it was a die cut kit or a, or a yardage kit, in your kit is a small spool of thread that's for your binding, but it also matches your melon. So feel free to use that. And again, because those are prints, it's not necessarily a perfect match, but it's um, it's the closest that I could get with those colors. So awesome. So with this block, so with that matching thread, I was able to stitch around the outside. And I'm gonna try to get this into the camera, but honestly, you can't really see the stitch that I used, but the stitch here is actually a very narrow zigzag. So I rarely satin stitch around my applique shapes. I typically will use a, a narrow zigzag. So I believe this is a, it's a two millimeter width and a fairly short um, length. So I believe this is a 2.0, 2.0 uh, stitch. So it's fairly close together, but not quite a satin stitch. So it secures the edges, but I don't get a lot of thread buildup around the outside edge. And actually, if I flip this over, duh, I can show you the stitch. So you can see that it's a very um, narrow but loose zigzag around the outside edge. Okay. Now, when you are stitching this, and I, if you look at the photo tutorial, I talk about how to actually turn the corner um, here. So when you come to a point, you stop with the needle down on the outside of the unit. So if I'm here, and actually, let me see, let me see if I can do this better with the overhead camera. So if I'm stitching this and coming down this way along this edge, I'm gonna stop on the outside of the corner. So I don't stop with the needle down in the shape, I stop with the needle down um, at the corner on the outside. And that way when I pivot and turn to keep sewing, my next stitch is to the left. And so that stitch is also going to be on the outside of that corner as I pivot. And then my next stitches will come down this direction. So I stop with the needle down on the right, pivot, and then continue stitching. And I did a series of photos in the photo tutorial, so if you wanna go and see that, I kind of show that, that stop, pivot, and restart if you want to really see that. The other piece that will help you with the applique is to add stabilizer underneath. So these pieces of stabilizer, it's a tearaway stabilizer. It comes on a roll. You can find this in, um, you know, t typically any, um, any sewing machine uh, dealer will typically have stabilizer. Um, you can find these in, um, you know, in the big box stores. You can order them online. But try your local quilt shop or your local sewing machine dealer for stabilizer. It is a lightweight 
tear away stabilizer and I just use this underneath the block. And what this does for me is number one, because I'm stitching around this applique and it's on the outside edge, what this does is it gives me something to stitch onto to start the stitching before I get to the applique. So this is gonna keep my block from getting um, or my threads from getting sucked into the machine because it's, you know, there's a, a base here. The other thing that it does is it keeps the applique and the block nice and flat so that your applique stitches aren't drawing in and kind of puckering in your unit. So I like to use stabilizer, the tearaway stabilizer, to make sure that my block stays nice and flat. And then after that, what I do is I did a stay stitch around the outside of the block. And a stay stitch is essentially just a straight stitch about, um, it's in your seam allowance, so it's about an eighth of an inch from the edge. And what that stay stitch does is I went all the way around the block. It keeps my the seams that I pressed open it keeps those seams, sorry, I'm just trying to get the camera to focus, focus, there you go. All right, so what it does is where my open, where I press my seams open, if I stay stitch here, that's gonna keep the seam from pulling apart as I manipulate the block. So that's one reason to do the stay stitching. And then the other piece is just to make sure that this applique stays adhered to my base fabric as I'm working with this block in the quilt. So it just keeps all of the edges secure while I work and keeps my open seams from pulling apart. And that's gonna be especially important as I come and actually do, tear away the stabilizer here. So, you know, tearing away the stabilizer is, um, you do want to kind of hold your block so you're not stretching your block as you pull the stabilizer away but it's just really simple to get this away from and out of your um, block. So we're just tearing that part out and tearing this part out. And this is a really lightweight, um, it's a really lightweight um, paper. You know, it's almost like, um, I, I liken it to like a lighter money, you know, not that you can go around, you know, counterfeiting and making money from this, <laughs> from this, but it's kind of that texture where it's kind of like a paper and a fabric. Okay, so now on the inside, I'm on the inside of the block and I need to get this paper out. So I just inserted a pin in between the paper and the block and just popped it around the outside seam so that I could get a place to start and finish tearing out this paper. And then there's a little bit that's gonna be left between the, in the seams. And I don't worry about that so much. I just leave it, I leave it there. It's not hurting anything. It's gonna break down a little bit. Um, you know, if you're washing the quilt, it's gonna break down a little bit. So you're not leaving enough of the paper in there to kind of be an issue. You can also just skip the stabilizer altogether and just be really careful as you're stitching around your shape to make sure that it stays nice and flat. So stabilizer is kind of a personal preference, but you know sometimes I like using it with applique because it gives me a good starting point and a place to kind of finish off and keeps the block nice and flat as I work. So that is, I believe I renamed this block Spirit of 2019 because it is inspired by the Spirit of, of 76 with a modern update. All right, so I'm gonna stop here and again, just go in and check and see. Any questions? I don't see any questions. You guys are so super quiet today. All right, back to Facebook. I'll see if there are any questions posted there. Let's see. Bop, bop, bop. The page is refreshing. Here we go. All right, and I don't see any questions over here either. So, well, fantastic. So that is uh, 
those are the blocks today. So I hope that you enjoyed those and, you know, had a good time on the webinar. Like I said, thank you for sticking with me through some of the technical issues. Um, and uh, I'm not going to promise there won't be technical issues le next week, but we'll just deal with them as they come. So, um, so next week's webinar um, is another Saturday one. I know there's one coming up where I have an event that I'm going to be teaching at, so I'm going to have to, um, you know, either skip that webinar or do it on a really odd day. But obviously, if I'm teaching on a Saturday, I can't also be doing a webinar with you. But it's been super fun today. I hope you guys enjoyed the little tutorial and you got some tips to use to help you get the blocks together and, and are able to get that done really quickly. So um, really fun. I had fun designing the blocks. I had fun making the blocks. I hope you had fun this week. And then we'll just be back on Wednesday with lesson three of Emma. If you haven't signed up, please go to lovebugstudios.com slash shop and click on the classes and events. Look under mystery quilts for Emma and you can sign up there with the class registration. So, uh, so I hope that you enjoy, have fun sewing this weekend and we'll see you next week. Bye.